Um, today, it's a pleasure for me uh, to welcome you, of course, on behalf of the working party of chemical reaction engineering of the FC, um, to this special webinar, which is of uh, great um, and important interest, of course, uh, not only to chemical reaction engineers, maybe also to other fields. And therefore, I would like uh, to welcome you, in particular, the people who are online, because um, I already see a raising number. And of course, this is very nice that uh, so many people are joining us online. And, uh, but before I will introduce uh, the speaker, will be Kevin van Heem today um, from Ghent University. I would like to hand over to the, uh, Hermann Pfizer, the president of FC, uh, to speak uh, to us and uh, to deliver maybe a morning uh, address huh? or an afternoon address uh, if you're joining from China probably. Huh? Okay, yes, Herman, please. Unfortunately, not a dinner address, Olaf. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, as a, the president of the European Federation of Chemical Engineers, it's my great pleasure to um, <clears throat> welcome all of you here to this uh, Spotlight Talk event. And I must say, I'm very proud of the 11 technical groups of the EFCE who have accepted the challenge of delivering a short or not so short session uh, by leading industrial or academic experts to you. And the response we got shows that this is a really valuable um, addition to the scientific collaboration that EFCE wants to support and initiate. You know, as a European Federation, we represent about 100,000 chemical engineers spread around 30 countries in Europe. And the interest just from the registrations we got goes far beyond that to basically every corner of the world that's awake at this time of the day. And our working parties and sections, which cover roughly the entire scope of chemical engineering, are really the core of it. So today we'll hear about chemical reaction engineering. I will also go and look into education or energy or quality by design and even something as tough as thermodynamics. So I'm extremely proud that this has happened and I'm extremely thankful uh, to Martine and Ines who've been at the core of uh, this event and whose hard work was really essential on making this happening. So I wish us all a very interesting talk today and I encourage you to dial in to any of the other spotlight talks we will still have this week and next week. Yeah, thank you very much, Herman, for the kind introduction and kind words, uh, uh, general words about FC and also about the uh, webinar series. First of all, of course, also, all, also my thanks go to uh, Martin and Ines to make this hap happen. And it, I think it's a great uh, two weeks series. So every day we can listen to nice talks or even some groups they have a larger program, but we would like to focus maybe on a topic which is a hot topic, a hot topic not only for chemical reaction engineers. And uh, it was our wish also to, uh, to address that to other uh, working parties and maybe also to young students, students will, um, let's say, be responsible for the future uh, in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years. And that's why we are happy that um, Kevin, Kevin said, well, I would like to uh, take the burden and I would like to um, speak about electrification of the chemical industry. And uh, that's why really we are very happy that uh, Kevin Van Kiem, uh, he will do the job for us and, 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 and I, I'm looking forward also to an encouraging and fruitful discussion uh, after his talk. Uh, but first of all, let me introduce uh, shortly Kevin. Uh, Kevin is right now full professor in the Faculty of Engineering and Architecture of Kent University and um, also as is stated, he is director of the Center of sustainable chemistry and of course also right now the director of the laboratory for chemical technology at Ghent University. Um, 
Well, he, he is trained, a trained chemical engineer. So maybe also I can call him a, a child of this chem, laboratory of chemical technology because he grew up there, he was trained there, he did his PhD there. And he was appointed as assistant professor for a short time of five years between 2010 and 15. Then he turned into his associate professor and now he's full professor since already three years. So um, great successful career already as a young scientist. And, um, but of course he stayed also outside. He, at MIT he was there for a couple of years and he was also at Stanford professor. And um, also he spent some time at um, industry. I think that's what I wanted to tell you. His research interests are quite broad. Yeah, right now he's involved in electrification process intensification, but also he's interested in machine learning and data mining. But of course, he has also a special interest, and I think that's um, about thermochemical reaction engineering in general, with a focus in particular the transition from fossil to alternative resources such as biomass, CO2, and plastic waste. I think that's all from my side. Kevin, please, the, in, in the normal times, I would say the floor is yours. Now I would say, um, how many eyes are staring at you? At least I see 360. And maybe there are some other people around the 360 eyes. So a lot of people are joining us, still dialing in. Please, Kevin, make them happy with the topic, electrification of the chemical industry, dream or reality? And maybe you can answer the question or you will postpone it for another 10 years. We will see. I will do my best, Olaf, to answer the question. So I hope you can see my screen. Uh, and that's, uh, I'm sharing the right screen and that it's, that's functional. Okay. Just move this out of the way. Yeah, so, uh, um, so welcome to my talk. Uh, thank you for the very nice introduction, Olaf. So I'm a professor in Ghent University. And uh, as you heard from my brief CV, I'm educated as a classical chemical engineer at the Laboratory for Chemical Technology in Ghent. So uh, I consider our group as, as one of the uh, leading groups in, in chemical reaction engineering uh, with a strong industrial focus. And Ghent is a small city about uh, 300,000 people in Belgium, and which is a small country in Europe, uh, as you can see on this uh, uh, map. But I tried, will try to convince you that we do our best to be uh, big in chemistry. And um, so Ghent University is a top 100 university, um, according to the Shanghai ranking, and is surprisingly holding uh, one of the better chemical engineering schools um, and one of the reasons is a strong industrial collaboration between our university and numerous world leading chemical companies. And most of these companies have production sites in the very close neighborhood of Ghent. And for example, within one hour driving, you have two of the bigger ports in the world. So being Antwerp and North Sea ports. In this port, you have chemical companies such as Dow, BSF, Total, ExxonMobil, Ineos, BP, Borealis, Covesto, and so many more. The port of Antwerp is even Europe's largest chemical cluster. So it is an important center and it's very important for uh, the Belgian economy. And this means, uh, this makes that Belgium can be considered to be the number one chemical country of the world. Uh, as you look at the impact of the chemical in the industry on the, the gross domestic product, uh, indirectly about 10% of the active population works in the chemical industry. So. Uh, we are at least number one chemical country, but per capita, uh, so uh, with everything relative. Um, Belgium is world class uh, for chemicals and plastic, but obviously this does not happen overnight. But in small steps over the past century, as uh, the chemical industry requires huge capital investments and processes that are in most cases running 24 seven. So the harbors clearly illustrate the importance of logistical advantages when producing chemicals and fuels. And this can also play a huge role for electrification, especially because of the availability of wind. 
as you can see, there's a huge production capacity of offshore wind uh, that's already available in uh, the neighborhood of, uh, of Belgium. And uh, that's further uh, being further developed. And it's also expected that this will grow substantially in the coming decades. So uh, the contribution of wind will, will grow uh, and will be more and more important. If one looks at the sunshine, then you can see that uh, the northern part of Europe has less potential and that the regions around the Mediterranean are really the places to be. Um, so Belgium is, is uh, well, not known for uh, its, uh, its sunshine, but uh, maybe sometimes a bit more for the, especially the rainy season. So uh, we put our hopes and we put our bets on, on wind. And so if you look at Belgian scientists, then I can say that uh, Ernest Solvay is one of the first big names in the chemical engineering field. And probably also the name Backland uh, will ring a bell. He's one of the first to work in the field of polymers. And he's also called the father of the plastic industry. So other famous scientists include Michel Boudard, who was a famous professor at Stanford and working in the field of catalysis and chemical reaction engineering. And so this is quite relevant for uh, at least uh, the area of chemical engineering that uh, I maybe like most is chemical reaction engineering. And the last professor I would like to introduce you is Professor Froment, uh, who is not only the father of uh, the founder of our group, but also uh, one of the big names in the field of reaction engineering. Over the past decades, uh, the Laboratory of Chemical Technology changed its name from the Laboratory for Petrochemical Technology to uh, Laboratory of Chemical Technology. So our, our group grows, grew substantially and at the same time the focus shifted away from only petrochemical applications to many other areas. Essential for all this R&D R &D work is the, uh, the availability of unique and typically large-scale experimental facilities. And for example on this slide you can see the view from uh, my office window when I'm allowed to be in my office then uh, you see that we have a huge technical hall with pilot plants and other facilities. And that's really, is, is, I think for us, very important to make the difference. However, experimental facilities are just one element that help you to do proper research. Okay? So obviously, obviously you need to combine that with theory, modeling that can account for uh, the, the so important chemical reactions. Uh, and then this way you can go to design. And that's basically the objective of generally the field of chemical reaction engineering is, is to do in the end model-based design and to also scale up. So in a nutshell, you see that uh, we need to combine uh, uh, even computational fluid dynamics in, in some cases, and I will give some examples also in this talk, with detailed kinetic modeling models for describing the chemistry. And uh, we try to validate that uh, with unique data and uh, in this way, we can make the leap of faith to go to the uh, process level. Um, on the process level, uh, um, and, and so you see here basically a, a summary of the, the methodology that we apply and the activities that we do in, in our group. Uh, so uh, you see that we do a lot more than just petrochemicals, and that's uh, uh, what we did 20 years ago. So we're active in polymer design catalyst material design, circular process design, low carbon technology, renewable chemicals and technology, reactor engineering, and we try to combine all these things. And you see on the right side also the, the other professors. And so um, that's also probably changes changed compared to decades ago. How we collaborate, we, we work as a team. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very proud to be involved of, uh, I think one of the strongest team in the world in, in, uh, in field of chemical reaction engineering. But uh, if we look at, at uh, the past two years, then uh, the perception that people have, that the general public has of the chemical industry, that's not positive. Uh, we have had plenty of people in the streets last year putting climate change on the agenda of, of our politicians. And interestingly, in First country show something about the chemical industry on television. They show a picture of a cooling tower sending steam in the air. It is a fact that the general public uh, does not really understand what we do and how a chemical process works. But this is obviously not a good starting point for a debate, and this typically puts us in a corner. And typically, we try to stay quiet, and maybe that's not the best strategy. 
that we should follow. Uh, obviously, uh, we cannot deny that the climate change, uh, uh, which greenhouse gas emission is the main driver, is one of the most urgent challenges humanity is currently facing. Uh, our Earth used to be able to keep the balance between released and captivated CO2, but due to increased anthropogenic emissions, this balance has been disturbed. So over the last uh, decade, there was an annual increase of approximately 2 ppm. In 2016, the atmospheric CO2 concentration stayed above the symbolic 400 ppm mark all year round for the first time. And with the Paris Agreement under the United Nations framework, then um, we hope really to reduce this, but it's clear that uh, this will not happen overnight. Uh, if you look at uh, the chemical industry, then we also should be fair and say that the chemical industry is responsible for a substantial part of the CO2 emissions in the world. This is also clearly illustrated by the CO2 emissions in my own country, or at least the northern part of uh, my country. So the biggest emitter is the chemical industry, closely followed by the steel industry. And the main part of the emissions come from last large gas, gas fired processes that require high temperatures to reach desired conversions, small equipment. In other words, that's because of, we, uh, of the need of very high reaction rates to get fast to the desired conversions that uh, we basically go to higher temperatures and, uh, and the result is, is the high emissions of CO2 because of combustion. But the emissions come really from a limited number of chemical processes, uh, as I will try to illustrate to you later on. And if you want to understand this, this better, then you have to understand how the chemical industry really functions. So in the chemical industry, we start from a limited number of resource, resources, such as oil, gas, coal, biomass, salt, water, and they are converted to bulk chemicals typically via one or more liquid or gaseous streams such as NAFTA or LPG. And these 20 base chemicals are converted to intermediates, uh, which are then further converted to consumer products such as plastics. Uh, the structure means that we create some kind of funnel where every ne everything needs to pass, and that's typically the, the base chemicals part. Just to give you some idea on how this chemistry, uh, uh, this chemistry that you saw uh, in the previous slide, I will give you give you an example. So, uh, if you look at at uh, the production of, for example, uh, polymers, uh, plastics, then we typically start with natural gas, or it can also be shale gas, that can be rich in ethane, and the ethane is then converted to ethylene, uh, which uh, then uh, can be converted to polyethylene, or uh, ethylene can be converted to ethylene oxide, which is then transformed to glycols or glycol ethers, and we go to PETs and, and, uh, and uh, the PEs. So you see always uh, uh, in the slides uh, the dependency on olefins, but also if you look a bit on the feedstock side, you see NAFTA uh, coming back several times, and also C2C3. Uh, so this really creates the, this funnel effect, so everything needs to pass through those, those base chemicals. So in my opinion, uh, what, we will need, what we need is, is really a Marshall plan for the chemical industry. Uh, and the start point is, is really the, the CO2 emissions of these chemical building blocks, not only from the chemical industry, but also uh, from uh, the CO2, from uh, the steel industry. Uh, um, what we also have to explain to people is that um, this will require enormous investments. Uh, these are really large scale units. So we cannot do this with a simple mouse click because some people nowadays believe that you can just with a simple mouse click, it can change everything. It's not that simple. Uh, it will require time and it will require a lot of money. So uh, that's why I try to make this uh, analogy with, with this Marshall Plan, uh, which also was a huge investment done after World War II. So if you look at strategies to reduce CO2 emissions, then uh, we can divide them in, in five different categories. Um, so we either uh, focus on avoiding of CO2, 
or binding of the emitted CO2 in a natural or non-natural sink. Yeah. Electrification can play an important role to re realize several of these strategies. Yeah. So the first strategy is, of course, improving the energy efficiency, which cur uh, uh, currently provides the greatest return on investment and has already been successfully applied in many industrial contexts. Although this approach still has potential, annual improvements are in the order of 1% to 2%. Uh, so they will definitely not be sufficient to meet the climate target. The second category is the use of low carbon energy sources, such as solar, wind, and geothermal. The third one is carbon, carbon capture and sequestration, which combines CO2 capture from large point source, sources, transportation to a storage site, and sequestration into a natural sink. And, uh, but it's currently rather limited due to technical and economic hurdles. The fourth one is carbon capture and utilization. So where CO2 is converted to products, can be high value products, lower intermediate value products. Uh, but CO2 is a very stable molecule, so a high input of energy is, is needed. And the fifth one is, is the use of renewable uh, feedstocks such as biomass or waste streams. And I'll try to give you uh, some examples of each of them. But I will uh, well, uh, tell you that industry is, is uh, definitely looking at all of them. So uh, of course, they are looking at energy efficiency improvements and, and trying to save uh, energy as much as possible. But I think at present, they also run to a certain limitations. They look at further electrification of heat, further electrification of process. and uh, also, valorization of waste streams, uh, the issues with plastic waste are definitely not new and a lot of post projects are being announced. Carbon capture and storage, I think the, the, the first demonstration projects were done, but this is now considered to be done also a part of the Green Deal on a larger scale. The use of low CO2 hydrogen, uh, that's also something that uh, is really uh, moving on quickly. And uh, also things like using of biomass, that uh, are being considered. But uh, many of these things uh, uh, are challenging, uh, either logistically or economically. So um, there's definitely a risk that, that some of these things will, will not uh, reach full maturity. But uh, I will try to, to give you some examples there, uh, what is, is possible on a short term and what will require a bit more time. So this is uh, the, the outline of my talk. So I will uh, try to explain you what electrification is. I will give some examples of ethylene production, hydrogen production, and CO2 liquidization, and I will end with, with some conclusions. So uh, what is electrification? Yeah. So the concept of electrification is schematically illustrated in this figure. The starting point is the availability of renewable electricity. This is uh, with an uh, objective to, re to reduce consumption of fossil resources, and ideally renewable and recycled feedstocks are sufficient. Yeah. After the transition period, uh, we will try uh, to use our plant without fossil resources, but for sure there will be a transition period. Outputs can be chemicals, but also fuels, and recycled streams of CO2 and heat integration will definitely be needed uh, in, uh, in the coming decades. So, um, so my definition of electrification is, is the following. So electrification of the chemical industry can be defined as a use of electricity to drive a chemical process, including conversion, separation, purification, and providing the utilities to assist in operating and controlling the process. And if you want to read a little bit more, uh, this is a science article that we wrote to you last year about potential electrification. The activities span across four lines, uh, power to heat, where we use electricity to generate or, up, or upgrade heat. Then we have power to hydrogen, so user electricity for chemical transformations via hydrogen. We have power to chemicals, so uh, where we really focus on certain chemicals, for example, via direct electric conversion. So note that this distinction uh, between hydrogen and other chemicals is not strictly needed, but it is expected that these two will move with a very different pace, and that's why I have made this uh, distinction. So, and finally, there, there's integration. So, we need to identify optimal integration, but also potential hurdles. 
consider, for example, storage and continuous availability of uh, electricity. And let's also not forget about uh, utilities. The big question is, is there enough renewable electricity? Yeah. And uh, the answer is also quite simple. Yeah. The answer is no. Yeah. So this will require enormous investments uh, to infrastructure and to the grid. Yeah. So this is really a necessity. So nevertheless, it's anticipated that more and more renewable electricity will become uh, online in, in the coming decades. And uh, so this big if could be resolved, but it remains a big if. And what about the price? So in Europe today, the actual electricity production cost is on average around uh, 40 euro per megawatt or $50 per megawatt. Currently, the rise of renewable uh, electricity has made uh, the market price for electricity more volatile, leading to significant time periods in which the electricity price for industrial consumers is very low or even negative, such that the process can be operated intermittently when process economics are favorable. The variability of electricity price is something that is a challenge for the chemical industry, but what is even worse is uh, the fluctuating availability. Uh, most chemical processes can simply not be turned on and off in a very simple way. So let me give you an example of a steam cracker. Uh, that's something that I, I know very well. And, and uh, it takes weeks until the unit can be restarted and until all the products are back in, in, uh, in spec. Uh, in particular, uh, if you look at the separation train, so the separation train is, uh, consists of a large number of distillation columns. And that's really not obvious uh, to turn that on and off. Uh, so we really have huge challenges, uh, not only on the reactor side, but also on the separation uh, side to, um, uh, to make sure that the processes can be operated intermittently and uh, again, uh, also from an economics point of view, if you look at that uh, CAPES and OPEC considerations, that uh, is also not obvious. And I will try to illustrate that later on with an example. Uh, because uh, we also, of course, uh, want to avoid that we are flaring all the time. Uh, so that's also a substantial uh, risk. So in this slide, you can see also a few examples of concepts of electrification. Uh, and uh, it's clear that the economic viability of uh, the three options on the right is today not there. Uh, we have to be honest, uh, today that's not the case. So, for example, uh, making hydrogen by electrolysis, uh, by electrolysis is more than a factor two uh, more expensive than for steam reform. This would imply that you would need a CO2 price uh, higher than 500 euro per ton to make that competitive. And that's a lot. Uh, so you see that other things play a role than, than uh, just the economics, if you really want to uh, make this happen. Um, so again, uh, also political decisions will be important to, to make sure that we make progress in that respect. Uh, the question, is there some low hanging fruit? Uh, so the biggest gains from a CO2 point of view can clearly be made in chemicals that require a lot of energy. Uh, other hand, uh, because they require a lot of energy. Uh, and if energy is expensive, this will not fly. So you have something like a chicken and egg situation. Um, and and uh, well, my summary is the only way that, that electrification can fly is, uh, is if electricity prices become uh, quite low for making chemicals. And uh, that's the only way to, to make it happen. There are plenty of studies on these topics, and one of them is uh, done by uh, by McKenzie, and which look at electrification potential of, of different sectors. So there really are some quite some interesting reads, and I strongly advise people that are interested in that and students that are following to, to take a look at those studies uh, and to make their own mind up. Right? Um, two sectors with potentially substantial integration possibilities are the steel and chemical sector. Right? So. This used to be two completely separate sectors that uh, were not talking to, to each other. But uh, for example, using hydrogen uh, for steel pr production uh, can make a lot of sense. Or converting the CO2 from the steel mill 
Um, so if you use, for example, um, blast furnaces, then you produce a, a, a steel mill gas, which contains large amount of CO2, but also CO, as you can see on the slide. And of course, the CO is, is a quite valuable product if you can separate it and use it. And there are currently uh, things that uh, are on their way. So for example, steel and oil, uh, which is a, a process which produces ethanol from CO. Uh, but there are also things that, that look at uh, reusing that CO2. Uh, for example, a process that we are working on is super dry reforming in Ghent, uh, where you convert the CO2 back to the CO, which then can be fed back to steel mills. So there are plenty of, of integration possibilities there uh, between uh, the, the chemical industry and the steel industry, because they are also, for example, making methanol from uh, the, the CO that's produced from the steel mill. So there will be, um, in the, in a few years, a big, very big demonstration project in, in the Ghent area. So uh, where actually uh, CO will be converted to methanol combined with uh, a 60 megawatt um, electrolysis plant and uh, producing the hydrogen for converting the CO and putting it, uh, making methanol. Um, so when will all this happen? Uh, and that's also a very good question. Um, this is a figure that can be found on the website of the Dutch Research uh, Center TNO. And, and it shows how they see uh, this field evolving. This can seem a bit like fortune telling, uh, because in the end, uh, to be honest, nobody really knows. So one thing is sure about this figure, it's not 100% correct. Uh, but nevertheless, it shows that it will not happen overnight. Uh, uh, that's very clearly. So you see here time scales up to 2050. Um, but okay, the first steps will be taken already in, in this decade. And you see with the Green Deal, that uh, it might even be faster than initially anticipated. Uh, because investment costs, uh, they, they play a crucial role. Uh, and also the consumer demand, I think, and social acceptance is today there. So, but the future will tell us if, if that uh, will, will stay like this. And, and also unexpected things like COVID uh, can uh, drastically change this or be an accelerator. So today this seems to be like an accelerator. So it's, let's go to some more detailed examples and start with, with olefin production. Okay. Olefin production, and more specifically production of ethylene and propylene via steam cracking, has an enormous production volume of several hundred millions of tons. Uh, steam cracking is and will be very likely the dominant process for the coming decades to make olefins. And that, is, uh, that can all be considered as a fact. This is also shown in this slide, uh, where uh, competitive technologies are compared with steam cracking. And if you look from a CO2 point of view, then uh, steam cracking uh, using NAFTA or ethane, which are low, shown on the left, uh, are substantially better than, for example, uh, using fissure drops to convert methane and then do steam cracking or oxidative coupling of methane. Uh, methane uh, methanol uh, via methanol to olefins or biomass methanol to olefins. And you see that uh, yeah, uh, if you use coal, that from a CO2 point of view, that makes no sense. Uh, so um, I think that is definitely something that we should have and keep in the back of our heads. That's, uh, that's definitely not the way to go. And, and that uh, countries that use that route, uh, that should be penalized. Um, essential um, in, in the whole discussion is also having access to cheap feedstocks and the availability, for example, of shale gas uh, has given the, the U.S. a substantial economic advantage compared to Europe uh, during the last decade. Uh, you can see that on, on this slide. Uh, you see here uh, North, North America and uh, you see that, that uh, the, the, the price for the feedstock is substantially lower. So that's definitely uh, a difficulty that the European industry is, is facing, and we should also be honest about it. And, and that's a competitive disadvantage uh, that, that, that is there. So we have to approach it also in a different way. Uh, the main part 
Uh, if you look at all of the production of the emissions, they come from uh, the furnaces in the steam cooking plant. Uh, in these furnaces, uh, fuels are combusted, and that's basically uh, a methane hydrogen mixture that is uh, recycled that's being produced as a side product. And that's sent, ba sent back to the furnaces, and these furnaces work at uh, yeah, very high temperatures, 1,100 degrees. They need about uh, 850 degrees on, on the reactor side. On the other hand, uh, we need very cold temperatures so, and high pressures uh, for the separation train. And uh, this means that also on the rest separation train, um, enormous utilities requirements are needed to create uh, the really the cold temperatures of up to minus 100 degrees Celsius um, to really separate uh, the ethylene, for example, from ethane uh, or things like in a demethanizer and so on. So, and this overall explains the overall high energy consumption of this, this process. And during the past five years, uh, we, we have tried a new European project called IMPROVE to improve the energy efficiency consumption of this process by 20%. And uh, even 20% uh, proved to be not that obvious. Uh, it was uh, not that obvious. So we have seen that uh, if we really focus on the furnaces, uh, because 90% of the emissions come from those furnaces, that uh, during the past 10, 20 years, there were not that many spectacular advances in that area. Um, but uh, I can refer you to a few papers uh, that we have published in this area to get a bit of better view in, in, uh, on this topic. I can see them on this slide. But uh, the main uh, innovations have been on uh, no novel reactive technologies and helped by, by chemical reaction engineering. Also alternative combustion technologies such as oxyfuel combustion and uh, new materials such as high emissivity products. And this can help uh, to reduce emissions, but again, uh, uh, not, not alone. Uh, um, all these technologies are currently being demonstrated in a real plant in Dow, in Tonneuzen, in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, and this is the only way that you can make really progress. Uh, you really need hard uh, data. Uh, data on TRL6 on, on large scale to convince industry that this actually is also possible. Uh, we, we looked at many things on TRL5, but uh, again, if you really want to convince industry, it has to be demonstrated. And uh, what we saw is that indeed we could make a difference, but the 20% the that we, we couldn't reach with, with all these efforts. Uh, um, and that's why uh, 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 one of our partners in, in this project came up with, with uh, something very clever that they patented. Uh, they uh, invented an alternative furnace design uh, um, where they recovered the heat from the process in a different way. Uh, and uh, they do some kind of uh, uh, yeah, heat integration, so where they recover the, the heat of the, the cracking effluent in a special heat exchanger. And uh, this really removes uh, uh, a substantial heat load over the whole furnace. And um, of course, this has also effect that, that uh, you produce a bit less steam. But if you combine that with electrification, and then uh, uh, that's what you see on, uh, on the right with uh, the CO2 neutral power for the, the steam production, then you can actually see that you can drastically reduce the CO2 emissions and go to 30%. But of course, uh, it again, it requires uh, uh, green electricity of which you consider that uh, this results in no, uh, no emissions. So modification of the furnace and, and uh, return on investment uh, was in this case less than two years. So economically it makes sense. But it also requires uh, uh, availability of green electricity to uh, uh, make up for the reduced steam production that, that's normally done in that furnace. But uh, there, there also are more clever things on the table and more advanced things. So this is one of the uh, things that I'm working on, which I, I really like. So this is a power to heat concept. And it's a revolutionary design uh, will, uh, could, uh, that really can replace uh, steam cracking furnaces. And uh, it basically is an electri electrically driven turbo machine. And uh, this means that you don't need combustion. So it can really directly avoid that 90% of CO2 emissions. 
And with a profound CFD study, with, with combined with some experimental analysis, uh, so we are really targeting to outperform traditional furnaces and become the new global star standard in all of them production. So what this actually is, it's, uh, if you can see on, on the middle, it's actually a rotor stator reactor. Uh, so you have a rotating vein and two stationary veins. And the first cascade is called uh, the stator and is positioned upstream of the axial flow rotor cascade. Second set of veins is positioned downstream of the axial flow reactor cascade. And the lecture is called the diffuser, uh, as you can see on the slide. And in between these two stationary veins, you really have a rotating vein uh, that is installed, and you see that movement with that uh, with that blue arrow, and that's really rotating at very high speed. In a nutshell, uh, this is really like a bad compressor. Uh, uh, so it's not compressing. Um, it basically is converting the energy into in the heat and, and, uh, instead. And we can really reach temperature above 1000 degrees at an order of magnitude, magnitude faster than in classical furnaces, and that's really important. So in classical furnaces, it takes about 200 milliseconds. Uh, in this uh, technology, this could be done in 10 milliseconds uh, based on our CFD simulations. So we have basically a rotor status system, uh, which uh, rotor internals are designed to deflect the main flow at supersonic gas velocities into secondary flow structures, and thereby converting the electricity for driving the, the rotor uh, to high levels of turbulent kinetic energy, which is in turn dissipated in PV. And that's a bit of the concept of that technology, but you see that it's a very clever power to heat. Um, so here you see a bit of the temperature profile that you can get in, in, uh, um, in such a design. And in this, in this case, it's, it's a donut design that, that uh, is envisioned, but you see always the temperature jumps on, on the slide. Uh, and in the veinless space, then uh, we don't really have a pressure buildup, but we, we stay more or less a bit isothermal, and the veinless space is a degree of freedom to play a bit with resonance times. But you see order of magnitudes um, of about 30 milliseconds, which is substantially smaller than the 2500 milliseconds in the classical uh, furnaces. And um, so uh, uh, you see really the shocks that happen, uh, and the shocks are then converted into, into energy. Yeah. And we can really go to very high temperatures up to 900 degrees. And what we did is that with the uh, 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 simulation package that, that we developed in, uh, during my PhD, and which is now uh, ending up in, in a spin-off company of Ghent University, we really, really looked at the potential of this technology. So this is really a reaction engineering code that is uh, commercialized. And we can look at, at all kinds of scenarios and look at uh, different feedstock, different technologies, different resonance times. And we combine that with, with very fundamental data that we obtained from a pilot and steam cracking uh, reactor where we really, really can measure uh, the product yields in, in a very detailed uh, way. And that has been translated into a very detailed uh, kinetic model that is implemented in that software tool, which we call uh, coil simulation. Yeah. Um, so this tool is really validated based on 40 years of data in, in our pilot plant, but can also be used for simulating this really completely novel reactor technology. And on this slide, you see the differences. And uh, so the, the dashed line is really the industrial, uh, classical industrial furnace. The full line is then uh, the new reactor technology, so the rotostator reactor uh, for steam cracking. And you can see that uh, the gains are uh, there. They don't look very impressive. Eh? So the predict is about three to 4% higher than the classical technology. But if you know that uh, increasing the yield of a steam cracking plant with about 0.1% results in several million euros extra profit, then you know that increasing it with 4%, that this re results in really an in, in order of 100 millions of uh, euro extra profit. So you can really see that, that uh, by innovation and electrification, you cannot only resolve the, the CO2 issue, you can also get better yields and better profit margins. So that's of course the ideal situation. And of course it's our objective to further develop this technology. And that's what we are working on in Ghent, but uh, also with, with other institutes. And 
Yeah, then one of the remaining issues of this process, of course, now you have combusted in, in the classical steam cooking furnace, the, the methane. So you end up with that methane. Uh, with methane, you can do many, many different things. Of course, you can use it for producing hydrogen, but uh, you could use it to together with plasma and again, to produce even more uh, olefins. Uh, so plasma is also uh, a very interesting technology um, that, that allows you, uh, and especially if you combine it with some catalysis there. So uh, you can really get, get quite high selectivities to, to olefins with, uh, with methane. Uh, conversion. So if you would combine those two options, then uh, of course uh, you, the yields of, of uh, uh, a classical steam cracker would be substantially increased because you would be additionally converting the methane also in olefins. And this is one of the areas there my what my colleague uh, Professor Stepanidis is, is working on intensively. So let's look at hydrogen and of course hydrogen is extremely hot uh, today. So uh, yeah. there's an increasing demand of, of hydrogen, uh, among others for ammonia, but also in refining applications. So you see that that's really, uh, it, it's really grows in importance. Uh, it can also be a future energy carrier uh, uh, for transportation. Uh, so hydrogen really has a lot of potential. And as I mentioned earlier, it's mainly produced by steam reforming. It's really the dominant technology. And uh, conventional steam reforming reactors, um, they, uh, uh, hydrogen is produced uh, by burning fossil fuels to generate heat. And uh, this industrial release about 10 kilogram CO2 per kilogram hydrogen. So a quarter of which comes from the, the fuel combustion. So other challenges are substantial coking that's happening on the wall of the reactors. Uh, the coal gasification process is used in commercial pr production of synthetic gas as, as a means towards clean use of coal. Um, but, but you see that uh, uh, if you look at coal gasification, that uh, really if you look at an enormous amount of CO2 that's being produced per kilogram hydrogen, that that's really something that's not to go for. So we look at electrifying this. And uh, in 2019, Wiesmann et al, uh, they, they showed that the gas-fired steam reformer can be substituted by electrically heated ones and thereby potentially circumventing emissions from fuel combustion. So in this electrically heated reactor, the heating is based on the joule effect. And the reactor wall, which is coated with the catalytic layer, is the main electric resistance. And this makes it possible to take advantage of the uh, intimate contact between the electrical heating source and the reaction site driving the reaction close to thermal equilibrium and improving selectivity and yields to work uh, and so on. So uh, this is also again then a step forward with electrical heating and a very power to heat concept. Yeah. Of course you also have electric electrolysis of water and um, where you decompose water into oxygen and hydrogen and there are four kinds of electrolysis methods such as alkaline water electrolysis, solid oxide electrolysis, microbial uh, electrolysis, PEM water electrolysis, so in terms of sustainability and eventual impact, PEM water electrolysis is considered as most promising technique for high uh, pure efficient hydrogen production from renewable energy sources. And it emits only oxygen as a byproduct without any carbon emissions. So, but considerable research has been uh, completed uh, in this area, but today the economics are not good enough compared to steam heating. But the road to cheap hydrogen is uh, uh, riddled with potholes and energy losses. So here you see something that has been uh, done, uh, invented in, in uh, uh, KU Leuven, uh, the group of, of Johan Martens, uh, so where they used the traditional solar panel, uh, uh, where uh, normally 18 to 20 percent of solar energy is, is converted into electricity. Electricity uh, here with with their hydrogen panel, they uh, were able to come produce uh, uh, with uh, 1.5 square meter hydrogen panel, they could convert 50% uh, of the sunlight straight into hydrogen gas. So that's another way uh, to, to try to be more efficient when you produce hydrogen. And then you have other alternatives such as methane pyrolysis, uh, where you have the decomposition of methane into molecular hydrogen and solid carbon. Uh, but then the value of that solid carbon is really quite, uh, quite important. 
also from the reactor design, there are many, many challenges. So uh, recovering the carbon co-product in a cost-effective way is, is not obvious. So for example, it can be performed in a bubble column uh, consisting of a layer of molten uh, nickel biodium alloy and a molten salt layer floating on, on top of the metal. And the, uh, the molten metal is, is a pyrolysis catalyst. The molten salt layer is added for removing contaminants from the carbon product. And you see methane is introduced in the bottom. So this is one technology that, that at the same time uh, can produce uh, hydrogen, but also with carbon. But again, uh, so the value of that carbon and, and uh, producing carbon with minimal upgrading is, is, uh, is not obvious. Uh, and washing away the salts, again, is, is quite challenging. So also there, there are plenty of challenges. So what will it be? Well, I guess uh, uh, nobody really knows what, uh, at least in Europe, uh, uh, at least in Europe, there's a strong drive to to make, uh, to try to make electrolysis competitive with steam methane reforming. As you, as you have seen from the previous slides, that is only possible when the electricity prices, when they drop substantially and that the efficiency also becomes substantially better than what it is today. So uh, again, uh, so for, for chemical engineers in general, there are a lot of challenges today, but uh, with all the efforts that are being done, uh, we are making very, very big steps. And uh, I see many, many, de many demonstration projects. So I think we're moving in the right direction. And, and from an economic point of view, we're getting closer and closer. So, and then I will end with some CO2 utilization concepts. So there are roughly five different conversion uh, approaches for, for CO2, direct electrochemical, direct bioelectrochemical, direct non-thermal plasma, indirect bioelectrochemical, and indirect thermochemical. Um, I have uh, in the following slides focused on electrochemical example, um, it's because it's uh, from all the uh, CO2 converting methods is one of the, uh, the most promising. It has an advantage that uh, it's easy integrated with non-low carbon energy sources, uh, and I think it, it has potential, but there also are some, some limitations. So uh, if you look at electrochemical conversion of CO2, then it can be done at ambient conditions. Uh, if you have a careful select selection of electrocatalyst, electrolyte and operation condition, it's possible to drive the electric conversion of CO2 towards desired products. Uh, so many different products are possible. The chemical consumption can be minimized by recycling elect electrolytes. And the reaction system is quite complex. But uh, the main challenges is uh, the low CO2 solubility and often poor selectivities and the high energy uh, requirements. But also the long-term stability of the electrocalyte is, 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 uh, uh, is difficult. So can this actually fly? And we'll try to uh, answer that with, with some examples. So, could this be, for example, be an alternative for, to produce ethylene? And yeah. uh, what is the CO2 avoidance potential? So we did a whole techno-economic study, and you see here the electrochemical reduction of CO2. Uh, we you see here the reactions that are taking place at the cathode and anode. Uh, you see here the global reactions, electrolytes, applied potential, and so on. Uh, considering the time, I will not go too deep on it, but uh, what are the, the key fig figures of merit? Of course, we have the the overpotential, uh, and, and of course we want to minimize the overpotential as much as possible. Uh, we have the Faradaic efficiency, which is a me measure for the product selectivity. Uh, we have a second uh, efficiency indicator, which is the energy efficiency, which is the ratio of the amount of energy in the products and the amount of energy put in the system. And then also an important parameter is the current density. Uh, which is defined as the ratio of the current at a given pot cell potential and the given uh, and the active electrolyte area. So um, we looked at this system and we looked at the state of the art um, and to enable a feasible large scale implementation of electrochemical CO2 reduction process, the development of an active, selective, stable and relatively low cost electrocalyte is, is a prerequisite. Yeah? And over the past few years, many researchers have focused on this exploration, but you see that, uh, well, there still are some challenges there. So as a rule of thumb, industrial reactors are typically operated at geometric 
current densities above 100 uh, milliampere per cubic centimeter, but at least 50% Faradaic efficiency. So there is what, uh, where we really want to be. And uh, we focused uh, on an application for the steel industry because there you have uh, a nice CO2 stream available. We looked at the, uh, the technical economics for that application. Uh, and the steel mill gas has some, uh, contains 25% of CO2, so it's a quite interesting starting point. And so this is the, the conceptual process design. So we have the flue gas from the steel mill, 25% is CO2, it's absorbed. Um, that CO2 feed is then going to, um, uh, uh, after being, being captured, to being converted in our electrochemical process. And then we have a product uh, purification uh, because we want to produce ethylene. And in this case, this is done via a cold box and then uh, classical distillation with uh, the ethanizer, the methanizer, and so on. If you look at the whole economic analysis, of course, then uh, you need the base case, and that was 100,000 tons uh, of ethylene production. And we compared uh, this uh, our case that we, we calculated with the steam tractor, which is the state of the art for that, uh, uh, for that process. And to make this, this 100,000 tons uh, of ethylene, we need about uh, 300,000 tons of uh, CO2. And we looked at gross margins, capex and opex as function of product selectivity, conversion, CO2 values, and electricity price. But just to give you an idea, the required power to make 100,000 tons of ethylene is 300 megawatts. So you can already imagine uh, uh, this is many, many mil windmills. And so this brings uh, already quite, quite a big challenge. Uh, so we really need a big uh, wind uh, windmill park to make this happen. And if you look at the economic evaluation, then what we see, and, and so the blue thing, uh, so the blue uh, bar is actually the capex for a steam cracker of the same size. So you see that from a capex point of view, this is really enormous. Uh, not, all, not only looking at the OPEX, so if you look at the OPEX, then only in the case that electricity becomes free, which is the yellow bar, this actually becomes quite competitive although the gross margins are uh, quite reasonable. Yeah. And, and so you see that the challenges, uh, both from a CAPEX and an OPEX point of view, are enormous. Yeah. Whatever assumption that, that we made, or given the uncertainty, the deltas are enormous. Yeah. And we also looked at the overall CO2 uh, balance. Yeah. And we did a cradle to, to gate life cycle analysis. Uh, we tried to look at CO2 avoidance costs. Uh, and we looked at, at opportunities for intermittent renewable energy. Uh, so there we saw that dynamic operation was difficult and uh, additional energy storage would be, would be ideal. So again, uh, also from that point of view, it was not easy. But in the end, uh, what is the big question? Uh, the big question is, uh, what is the most efficient way today to use one megawatt of green electricity? Uh, is is it best to produce olefins with that uh, one megawatt? Uh, so that's, uh, and then what we see is that uh, we basically avoid 0 0.1 ton per CO2 per, that, per megawatt. But if you compare that to a coal-based power plant, then if we would use that same one megawatt, then we would avoid 0 0.8 tons of CO2 per ton uh, per megawatt. So if you put it in that perspective, then it's really a lot more beneficial to use that one megawatt for uh, making green electricity to replace one megawatt of gray electricity than to use to convert it to, uh, than to use it to convert CO2 electrochemically to ethylene. And I think that's in the end a very important message uh, that, that we always have to think of. Uh, we, we can think about electrifying the chemical industry but you really have to put this in, in the complete picture, in the big picture. And, uh, and the big picture is more than just the chemical industry alone. It's, and also more even than the steel industry. But uh, so, and, and then if you look at the situation today, then, um, then you see that chemical CO2 uh, has many challenges, eh? both from a CAPEX and an OPEX uh, point of view. Uh, you really need almost electricity for free. Um, you get the negative overall CO2 balance, of course. But today, uh, it's better to use that green electricity to replace uh, coal and gas-based power plants 
then instead of, of electrochemically converting CO2 to, to ethylene. So I think that's an important side note. So with this, I would like to end uh, so with some overall conclusions. So electrification uh, will happen, but the capex is huge. And uh, today there's also simply not enough renewable electricity. And we can only hope that that uh, becomes available in, in the coming decades. For me, power to heat seems to be a first logical step uh, next to hydrogen from electrolysis. And I think the EU is, is trying to do everything it can to make that happen. Um, but governments say they really will play a huge role because without cheap electricity and also de-risking, so there's always a, a margin, a margin of risk that uh, a company is not willing to make. And I think with the Green Deal, there are plans on their way to put part of the risk with the EU or with local uh, governments, uh, then, then this can fly. But otherwise, I think this, this will really not fly. Uh, so with this, uh, uh, I open the floor to questions, um, uh, but uh, uh, I hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, so you see everybody is applauding, at least uh, I see it. Um, uh, and uh, what I forgot at the beginning of the talk is um, because we got a, already a question from the audience that this is a recorded um, webinar so the webinar will be also available then on the on the youtube channel of the uh, fc so um because i got the question here um will be the slides available yes or not and uh, so we recorded the lecture and it will be available on the youtube channel and uh, there's a second question maybe uh, is this work already published? Now it's published, I would say, huh? Yeah, so, but several parts are published in different papers. So, for example, the, uh, the last part on uh, why, what to do with the one megawatts and, and looking at uh, the CO2 utilization, that's uh, just published in one of the, the open access paper of the, of the European Federation of Chemical, Indus uh, Chemical Industry. And, and then... Uh, it's even work done together with industry. So you will see that one of the quarters is uh, Matthijs Ruitenbeek, who is uh, from Dow. And that's always good to, to do this together with industry because of course, as an academic, you have your, your vision. I think it's always mm -hmm. good to have that industrial feedback and, and uh, to challenge you. But <laughs> I think that's really contributed to, to making also the, the bigger picture analysis uh, because yeah, uh, we focus really on this this area, uh, but in the end, uh, if you look at electrification, it's more than the chemical industry, and, and uh, that's an important message. But most of the things that you have seen uh, in this uh, presentation are published, and I refer to several of those publications in, in the slides. So you can see them typically in uh, uh, in small in, in the slides, uh, and the people that are interested can always contact me to have a PDF version of the, of the slides available. So. Yes, thank you. Thank you for uh, your answer. And of course, also for the possibility that uh, you will su supply the, um, the slides. Um, I also forgot uh, to tell the, the audience that they can write within the chat function so that we get the questions because it's not just that one, but should tell everything and so there was, there should be a, um, a living uh, discussion and uh, so if you have any questions from the audience please leave them in the chat and we will uh, channel this to everybody and so um, that's my pleasure of course to moderate then also a little bit the discussion now so there is one question which goes back to the RSR, so to the rotostator reactor. Yeah. Is the rotostator reactor affected by mechanical problems during the process? Uh, 
If yes, how can we challenge them? So it's more or less a little bit more practical question, but maybe you experience, you experience already some, some questions. Uh, so, so some so problems the, also. So the, the Rotor Starter Act uh, has, uh, there's the first version that has been built a um, few decades ago. And then uh, that was used for doing some tests. Um, and during operation, indeed, they, they saw uh, some issues. One of them is, of course, coke formation. Mm -hmm. And coke formation is one of the, the side products uh, or side reaction that, that occurs in, in many chemical processes, catalytic or non-catalytic. Um, and uh, that was definitely a challenge. Uh, obviously, anybody that, that knows and, and that is running compressors, that yeah, uh, they tend also mechanically to uh, to fail once in a while, and uh, uh, how to uh, well go to a safe shutdown uh, is also not that obvious because you're really working at very high temperatures, and uh, that's also was was definitely one of the challenges that uh, still needs to be overcome. I would say that uh, um, because. Yeah, in the end, uh, safety for the chemical industry is, is the number one priority. And that's always the number one priority. And having a rotating machine with this, this high rotation speeds at very high temperatures is something that, that uh, most companies uh, would, would consider to be very risky. And, and that's why, why the, these, uh, these technologies, they sometimes have difficulties to enter the market. Yeah. And, and uh, so what will happen now with these technologies uh, is that they will first, of course, be, be demonstrated on a big of, uh, bit of larger scale. I know that is at least uh, an attempt to try to do this uh, by the company Kohlbrook. Um, and they are trying to, to demonstrate it on, on a larger scale. And, uh, well, that will be, uh, yeah, that will give so many results. <laughs> that uh, I think people will have to go back to the table and, and, and redesign that, uh, that unit. Mm -hmm. But the fact that to use basically the concept of using a bad compressor, I think that that's in the end very, very, very smart. And, and uh, it does not only have possibilities for uh, uh, thermal uh, processes, but I think also for catalytic processes, if you combine that with the uh, uh, clever positioning of, of the, the catalyst, that is, uh, I think, a very, uh, very efficient way to uh, uh, to electrify the process. And uh, so I see a high potential for these type of reactors. Thank you for this uh, answer. You already mentioned um, Kohlbrook or Kuhlbrook. Yep. And uh, because we got a specific question also, and uh, somebody would like to know um, what is what is the exact difference between the presented RSR and the RDR from company Kuhlbrook? Is there any difference? Or maybe there is another question which is connected to the principle of the RSR. By what mechanism is heat generated in the RSR? So maybe yeah, you so just uh, give us a brief um, overview again about that, about the difference and of course about the uh, heat mechanisms for the generation of the heat. Yeah, so I, so basically, so this is uh, uh, even a design that is uh, for, yeah, basically like, like, uh, like Colbrook. Eh? So, um, so the, what you see here is the, the stator eh? and you have the, then the rotor, which is um, done with, with uh, a blue uh, line so that that one is moving. And then you have the diffuser and uh, you see this is now a torus design. So this is a torus design that uh, uh, where you have a recirculation of the gas so that really recycles the gas to um, until you reach after a number of cycles the exit. And basically every time that uh, that gas sees that rotor then it heats up. Yeah? So then you have the, 
um, electrical energy, which is converted into rotational energy, which is then uh, yeah, transformed in kinetic energy, and that kinetic energy is then diffused uh, in, in thermal energy. That basically is, is the, the concept of that rotostator energy. So the electrical energy is, is, using, is used to drive the rotor. The design of the, the stator and, and the diffuser are uh, ex yeah, extremely important to convert as much of that uh, input energy into heat and not in increasing the pressure. Uh, so, so that's different to compare to classical convert, uh, compressor. In this case, we don't want to compress, we really want to create heat. So we really want to create dissipation um, in, in this technology. And uh, well, I think Colebrook is definitely one of the leaders in, in this area. So they, uh, I think, are from all the companies that are working in, uh, on these kind of technologies because they're not alone. Uh, there also are uh, groups uh, in, uh, in China and uh, in, in Russia uh, working on, on these uh, technologies. Um, but I think they have uh, by far evolved in, in the, the furthest and, and they are, uh, they hope to be, be demonstrating this I think in 2023. Uh, so, and this means demonstration really on, uh, yeah, really kiloton scale. So this is not a small scale uh, demonstration. So I think Colebrook is really, uh, uh, at least from what, what I know, uh, the furthest with, with their design. Um, and it's really, I think, one of the companies to follow, I would say. You're muted, Olaf, you're, you're muted. Yes, no, I, I'm not mute anymore. Yeah, sorry. Uh, maybe some more uh, general questions. No, maybe some specific first. Uh, um, there's one, uh, have you compared usage of green electricity for dual heating and steam cracking versus CO2 electrochemical conversion to ethylene? So maybe a direct comparison of... Um, yeah, so, well, yesterday we had really our closure meeting of that European process, that the project that I mentioned, so the IMPROVE project. And, uh, so would our final deliverable was there uh, to do really a complete analysis of 11 different scenarios. And, and this is really also one of them. Um, and uh, there's really an important side note that people have to make. Yeah? So in, in all these chemical processes, we have emissions related to combustion. Uh, and and uh, by electrifying and using green electricity, we can make them almost zero because we consider green electricity per definition as being zero. But if you look at all these chemical processes, then maybe the biggest uh, CO2 footprint comes in the end from the resource that we use. If you use the current LCA methodology, then uh, producing the feedstock uh, is that ethane, propane, or the naphtha that has uh, a footprint which is typically even higher than what's coming from the process. Uh, so if I say there's one ton of CO2 produced per ton of ethylene, then I'm only speaking about the CO2 that's produced by combustion. And so by electrification, you will bring that down. And uh, uh, for me, then the efficiency of uh, the power to heat concepts or uh, electrical furnaces, I think is more efficient than um, the electrochemical roads that I of, uh, that I showed, uh, so that the efficiency is definitely higher. Uh, because if you look at the 300 megawatt that you need, that's about 300 megawatt. That's what you need for a complete cracker. The complete cracker has then 10 times more production capacity. But you really cannot forget the emissions that are also corresponding to the use of of resources, and that's why I also would like to stress that that we also need to shift step by step 
to either renewable uh, or uh, alternative feedstocks, for example, plastic waste. Uh, so plastic waste is really is, is, has huge potential and uh, there are several projects being done converting that back to uh, liquid energy carriers uh, or liquid streams that can be recycled back and then be used for producing olefins again. Um, so I think also on the, the resource part, we really need to work and, and we should really not ignore that um, also there, there are substantial CO2 emissions. So electrification of processes is one thing. Uh, we also look, should look at, uh, at other feedstocks. Thank you. And uh, maybe another question connected to CO2 balances uh, for electrochemical processes. There's one specific question. Uh, could you elaborate how the overall CO2 balance for electrochemical processes can be negative? I guess this assumes that the CO2 used as feedstock is permanently fixed in products, which will not always be the case. Yeah. Um, that's indeed correct. Uh, that that's uh, if you look at uh, LCA type of methodologies, I think you can debate about many things, <laughs> how things are accounted for, and how the bookkeeping is in the end done. Um, I do not always agree with all the statements that that are made. Uh, for example, if you use uh, biogas, uh, which contains methane and CO two then um, that's considered renewable without emissions. So, but if you combust biogas, yeah, then, then you get CO2 emissions, but that's zero because it's, uh, so uh, the, the accounting is definitely, uh, definitely one, one issue. Um, obviously, if you store the CO2 then uh, as in the end a material, with a substantially long lifetime. And if you go to ethylene, then I think 95% of the end uh, product is uh, polyethylene. Then you can say that this is some kind of storage. Uh, of course, if you convert CO2 into methanol or as a, that will be used as a fuel, that's maybe yeah, uh, an incorrect statement. So it really depends on, on uh, uh, what you will do then further with, with these building blocks. And that's why the, this funnel, this, this chemist tree, uh, with this, uh, this tree that you have, uh, it really depends on what will you do with these, with these building blocks. And, and what I expect is that, um, well, electrification of transport will, uh, will happen definitely of cars. So the use or the need for fuels will, will, will reduce. And that uh, also in that area, uh, there will be a substantial uh, shift. So also the conversion to fuels will likely yeah, will become less and less important. But I think it will remain uh, still important for the, the coming uh, coming decades. Uh, we are in transition. We are really in a transition uh, period. Thank you. Um, I, I know that a lot of people are asking maybe then, well, CO2 as a feedstock also. And, uh, but uh, maybe then we run into the problem how to get the CO2, how to get the pure CO2 maybe. And um, so that's why there is one question which um, addresses a little bit the use of CO2, which can, and um, so the question is, what if the chemical processes were all conducted in supercritical CO2? So maybe we have CO2 enough, so why don't we use supercritical CO2? If everyone uses CO2 in the, in, uh, the process, uh, might this be interesting to reduce CO2? Of course, uh, CO2 would not be consumed, but just used, but might this help? It's always now the question, trade-off of using CO2, because at the end we need maybe also CO2 in our uh, C-containing products. So in our polymers, of course we have enough polymers, so maybe we have to recycle the polymer. I think still we have to, we, have, we cannot answer the 
question. Uh, oh, but it's a good question. It's a good question. So, um, and that brings me also back to the, the integration with the steel industry. Uh, and and uh, um, if you look at that, uh, yeah, how steel is made, it's mostly uh, done in blast furnaces where they use uh, still coal and then that's results in CO2 emissions. But if you look at, at the CO, uh, the carbon, uh, if you would take the CO2 and, or the, and the CO that's produced, if you look at the carbon that comes from that steel production, there's a very good match in the amount of carbon that we need for chemical processes. Um, so from an integration point of view, uh, if you put, just put it on a carbon basis, this really makes a lot of sense to connect those two sectors um, and then use the CO2 to, to produce uh, chemical products. Of course, then uh, you forget about economics. Um, and that's also the point I wanted to make with, with, with olefin production. Uh, most chemical, well, uh, the, the profit that most chemical companies make is just because of the delta between the starting material and, uh, and, the, and the end product, and then taking into account the energy that you need. But in this case, for a lot of electrochemical process, the energy um, that you need is so substantial and, and the, the price of electricity is simply too high to be competitive at, at this moment. So um, today, if you really want to make olefins very cheap, well, then you go to the cheapest location, which is, is, is the US, and you produce it there. They don't care that much about CO2 emissions yet and, and uh, they don't penalize you. So that's why this is really, a, it's a global, uh, so we really have globalization of this whole issue. And that's also a big risk uh, because that's, that's one, of, one of the points for, for our Marshall, Marshall Plan. If we do this as Europe alone, and, um, and if we use the, the current emission trade system that is on the table and that, that is used today, then we will destroy our chemical industry then the chemical industry will just move away and Europe will be CO2 neutral because uh, nothing will be produced here anymore. But it will be done in China, it will be done in the US, it will be done in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. And I don't think that's also what we want. Uh, so yeah, that, 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 is, that is the risk. Yeah? So the risk is that we really destroy our complete chemical industry, which is uh, so, I think, which is, crucial for for uh, uh, for Europe uh, yeah, if, if we don't do this in a fair si a fair way and so the, the emission trade system is needs to change and needs to account for uh, yeah, for certain things which are for example done in China if you make ethylene from uh, from coal yeah if you see look at the emissions, that should be, yeah, that should not be allowed. Uh, they should be massively taxed, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. Mm, yeah, always. Globalization plays a major role then, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there is one more question with respect to the using of electricity um, what do you think about process furnaces, really big ones on electric drive? So using really big process furnaces, is it possible in competition to fuel gas? What is um, here? Yeah, so if you would ask me the same question five years ago, I would say it would not be possible. Huh? Mm -hmm. and then, uh, but I know that, that now several companies, I think like Lindy, are working on those uh, and, and they are really in a test phase. So um, I think it's closer than we think. And, and uh, so many of these, these uh, topics are studied in proprietary projects. So it's actually not that far. And, uh, but there are also other things that, that you can imagine to electrify furnaces uh, that, that uh, think about plasma torches. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then uh, it's also a very straightforward way, if you think about it. Uh, but so there are many, many different things, but 
and and uh, many things have evolved a lot further than than people believe that uh, that they are so I, I think that Linda is pretty far with uh, their electrical furnace and I expect some some announcements in the in the coming year uh, mm -hmm. about that yeah. I'm glad that you mentioned plasma technology and you had already one slide also on this so what about the future of plasma technology um, how far are we away from getting really products or product distributions uh, in comparison now with the with the today's technology yeah for me if uh, the main issue with plasma is always the scalability and the conversions yeah? so in some of these plasma technologies um, the conversion and scalability that that is that's the key but you see that some of these plasma technologies scale pretty well and then especially some of the thermal plasmas but even uh, some other classical plasma technologies they, they don't scale that bad uh, anymore and uh, if you look at technologies like plasma gasification uh, i think that's one of the things that that that, that will happen and there are some demo projects there uh, Companies uh, like, for example, I think Pyro Pyrogenesis, which is in uh, Canada, or there are uh, companies in in, uh, in the US, maybe not enough in Europe yet. So I would really, uh, I think plasma really has potential, and uh, uh, and it's in some cases it's quite scalable. But if you really want to make an impact with electrification, that's also what I, what I try to illustrate. Then. You have to focus on the big things first. So scalability of technology is therefore uh, therefore crucial, because otherwise plasma will always be considered as the sort of end of pipe technology. And that's what some people are afraid of, that only for very exotic applications where they're basically uh, like waste treatment, uh, uh, that it would only be used in those applications. So, but maybe together with some catalysis and uh, I have a very clever colleague in that respect, so uh, Giorgio Stefanidis, who is working very actively on that in, in Ghent and in Athens. So uh, he, he tries to convince me that, that uh, uh, this, this will actually fly in the coming years, and I take him for his work on that. So. Thank you, Kevin, also for this uh, answer for this precise answer with respect to plasma technology, we will see how it will end. Maybe in 10 years or so, we think a little bit different from that. Huh? So, let's see. I still have three questions left, which are a little bit more, let's say, um, looking into different um, directions. And, uh, but uh, let's see. There is one which is uh, which about the high capex which is required. And um, so the question is more about how do you estimate the future competitiveness of electrified chemical industry in Europe? It's also um, more or less than at the end a political question of course also and um, and how do you think we could initiate a global momentum but yeah. well, it actually is happening so with the green deal and and uh, mm -hmm. um, there's really a lot of money available and that's what's your intention i think that's also the, the right moment to do it um, these funds are becoming available uh, not only for uh, smaller scale, but also for demonstration and even larger scale projects. Uh, think about 100 megawatt electrolyzers and so on. So um, it is. Uh, so the, the capex, well, is huge, but I think on the long run it will pay out. Uh, so if you look at that, uh, all the the money that is in the end. Uh, yeah, going to to uh, to to oil and and uh, which is uh, uh, moving outside outside Europe by by using local green electricity, 
you can avoid that that uh, part of that money is basically uh, moving outside Europe, but basically stays in, in there. And uh, but you, of course you need the infrastructure, and that's what I mean also with the de-risking. So um, most of these projects are not so far of being break even. They're really not that far away. And so you just need a bit more uh, uh, just to make sure that the companies make a bit of money and that's not enormous. And I, I think that that's, uh, if you explain that in a simple and proper way to uh, the European population, I think they will understand. This will not have an enormous impact on their budget, but it, it will have enormous consequences for the environment uh, and for the uh, long-term uh, competitiveness of the, the process industry in general. Mm. And I think that's why it's so crucial. Eh? So I think we have to realize that we are sometimes competing against economies which are uh, yeah, no market, uh, no, there's no free market economy. Eh? And you can debate if that is uh, fair that we uh, as Europe allow that to, to enter in, into an unfair competition. So, uh, but then, okay, you, you, it's again politics, eh? but you see that the, the political part is, is very well, uh, is, is crucial. Uh, but I think Europe is making now the right decisions. They, they see really the, the urgency and they really are putting the money on the table. And that's what we need. Mm -hmm. you, you already addressed the environmental issues. And so there is one question where somebody is, would like to know your opinion about that. I, I just want to ask you this because uh, it's a question about nuclear power plant as an energy supplier. I know it's uh, often asked a question, how, why don't we use nuclear power plant? Germany has a clear answer for that. Uh, we shut them down. But uh, still, uh, the person would yeah. like to know your personal opinion about that. Uh, it, it all depends on what, what you consider your priority. Yeah? And, and uh... I think that's um, as a person, I I think you have to give everything a chance. Uh, you have to do an objective analysis of all the technologies that are available, and uh, in the end, uh, make your final dis decision. So, to exclude a technology, even to exclude coal, I think that's not wise. Huh? Um, I think that that uh, that should be part of the discussion. So excluding things, I'm, I'm absolutely against uh, those things because also uh, definitely also nuclear has uh, important applications being that in, for example, in the medical sector. So uh, saying that nothing can be nuclear, I think that definitely is not, not, uh, not the right choice. If I look at just my country where 60% um, of electricity is, is uh, produced from uh, nuclear power today, then, um, yeah, if you stop with nuclear uh, electricity and replace that with um, gas-fired plants, then uh, you have to tell to your people that this will increase CO2 emissions. You have to be honest about that. That's a political decision. Um, uh, but but saying that we will close our nuclear power plants and we will decrease CO2 emissions, that's absolutely uh, a lie. And I think that that's, if really if your number one priority is uh, no or very low CO2 emissions, then I think it's very difficult without nuclear. I think it's, uh, and it really depends on your priority. But But if as Europe, you really put so much effort on saying that we really want to have zero CO2 emissions, then I think have zero nuclear power in Europe, I think that's extremely difficult. And I don't, I have seen scenarios with, where they look only at wind and solar. I think it's really unfeasible. So you will need then fossil resources, which will result in, in CO2 emissions. So for me, it's a matter of priority, but if your priority is number one, CO, no CO2 emissions, then I think it's extremely difficult without nuclear power. And, and that's also what a country like the Netherlands is also now realizing. 
Um, maybe I have one question uh, because uh, at the end, I think one of your statement was that using the electrochemical conversion of CO2, this will be maybe the second step. Maybe the first step is um, to use the electricity in order to reduce the emissions, et cetera, or to increase the effectiveness uh, for the still having the coal-based or, or gas-based um, technology for producing products? Or is it, is it wrong what I got? So you said, yeah, so basically... Compare so both, maybe. Electrochemical yeah, so conversion to, let's say, using electricity for enhanced... Uh, um, activity at the still existing processes yeah so so what i believe is so the first thing what will be electrified is utilities mm -hmm. okay? utilities that's that's uh things like compressors and so on and, and yeah there are many opportunities there and and uh, the investment is is uh is substantial but it's not as large as making completely new plants and I think that the modular aspect of many of these uh, investments is also important that you, and I think that's also something that, that uh, I like about, uh, for example, the rotor stator technology. Uh, if you have the steam cracking plant that consists, for example, of 10 furnaces, you could replace one of them at first and just step by step increase the number of uh, uh, electrically driven reactors. Mm -hmm. If you really go to um, fundamentally different technologies like uh, the electrochemical processes, I think today the, uh, the, the investment cost is, or the, is just so huge today that nobody will take, take the risk. If you just do the techno-economic analysis to build something at a reasonable scale, today the, the risk is just too, too high. And, and uh, Companies are not willing to uh, to take that risk uh, today, and, and um, so that's just what I see. So, and if you do it really in a stepwise approach, in different uh, yeah, smaller steps, utilities, then part of the process, that can work for companies because they have to do all the, always investments at some points, and that that gives them also some time. Obviously, uh, the, this means that you go to yeah, a scenario where you were gradually fade away with CO2 emissions, and uh, the impact will not be uh, it will not be immediate. Uh, but of key, if, if you look at the impact of working from home, <laughs> that uh, what we have now encountered, that that can be also a big impact. So um, there, are, there are other ways. But but I really believe in a gradual introduction of all these technologies to give companies also the time to adapt and to to survive this transition mm -hmm. and maybe there is one more question from the audience more a general question also on your opinion i think this is uh, the, the chemical industry can help in developing alternatives for energy storage. Well, so far we just spoke about electrification of processes. Now we switched a little bit also in maybe storing the electricity. Yeah. What is your opinion about that? It's indeed a very, uh, very good question. Very good question, and uh, was one of the questions what kept me awake last night. Uh, so, really, what is the best way to do this? Uh, because if you look at um, the fluctuation availability of electricity and uh, the way that you want to run chemical processes, that's not really a good match. And, and uh, my wife used to operate a steam cracking plant, so I know that. Yeah, you cannot really turn these things on and off. So that, and 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 any chemical plant you want to run that's eight thousand hours per year, because otherwise you will be losing money because of the the, the margins. So you need a buffer. 
and chemical storage in that respect has huge potential. Um, but what is the best chemical way to store it? Uh, that was kept keeping me awake last, uh, awake last, last night. Um, we are looking at different things uh, in Ghent and doing different studies. Uh, can it be uh, ammonia? Can it be um, a form of hydrocarbons? Can it be just hydrogen? Can it be methanol? Can it be something else? Um, we are doing the scenarios uh, yeah, the, now. And, and uh, I hope that I can see some some uh, some differences there um, to see what what for me has the most most potential. But today, I don't know the answer. And but it's it's really it's keeping me awake uh, at night because I, I think it's really, really crucial uh, and to to take advantage of uh, the availability of, of cheap electricity. That's the way that we should proceed. And, and, and to store that in a chemical form, I think that's one of the best way. But I don't know today which one it is. Mm -hmm. you, you, you mentioned several molecules. And uh, besides that was also ammonia. So what is your opinion on ammonia? Comparison? Yeah, well, I know it's always C containing compounds and of course, Ammonia has no C, so it's a C-free compound. But uh, what do you see? Where 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 can we use ammonia then? Well, you can use ammonia also for combustion and and for uh, for if you look at that. I think some of the ships of uh, Yara, which is one of the major uh, ammonia producers, they run on uh, ammonia. So uh, you can use it as a, as a fuel as well. Uh, uh, I see always difficulties with with uh, emissions and NOx and so on. I don't know how that is, uh, what, what kind of risk uh, we have there, but uh, probably with with the catalytic uh, combustor that can probably be be reduced. Uh, so from that point of view, I think we shouldn't exclude ammonia. Um, I yeah, just from my nature, I always feel more comfortable with, with uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But uh, uh, yeah, ammonia, uh, based on the first calculations, is, is, uh, looks, I think, on paper, at least better than, than, uh, than, hydro, than, for example, methanol. So the key challenge there when you produce ammonia is, is the high pressures. Eh? So we, we still have the Haber Bosch process, which is used for uh, for making ammonia and which is difficult to beat. I think we need uh, new catalysts, uh, which can work at, at lower pressures. Uh, so yeah, to uh, to produce ammonia. So that, from a research point of view, that would be a major breakthrough. But I know that uh, research from DTU or uh, I think the group of Noskov and so on, they are working on these things. Uh, to go to low pressure um, ammonia production, but that I think that would be a game changer. Uh, if you really can produce ammonia at low pressures, I think that would probably turn it maybe in, in the favor of ammonia. Yeah, thank you, thank you for your ideas and comments about that. There is, uh, I think, one last, I would say, last question which just came in, and then we are about to and also this um, webinar. And there is uh, more or less one with, with, which deals with R&D and um, how can we from the basic R&D to a TRL of five or six. So there is a specific question. Can you provide some ideas on how we can move from R&D level to a TRL five or even six level. There seems to be a valley between R&D and getting industry to adopt this. What happens There's if the chemical industry doesn't respond? Is there any, is there an incentive beyond just environmental? Yeah, so it's the known value of that. And then uh, typically after TRL four, then, uh, you need uh, companies to engage, and I'm very fortunate that, that uh, in Flanders, uh, the government realized this. 
so they they uh, created a special moonshot uh, program where they fund TRL two to four, uh, but also has a part to to go to higher TRL levels. And uh, I see also now uh, uh, in the new in the new horizon uh, program, I see also there that uh, the focus is also a lot more on on having these th things demonstrated. And if you look at, at for example, uh, Spire, that uh, and that will become, uh, I think, People for Planet probably in, in the upcoming call. They can really help to uh, to bridge that that gap. I think there are now funding envelopes available of up to uh, several uh, 30, 40 million to really make that jump for very good cases. So again, there, I think the European Union is helping to uh, at re to make sure that that uh, the that we don't have those issues anymore. But uh, until a few years ago, that yeah, it was almost impossible to go from TRL4 to something else because you really had to go uh, to venture capitalists and they wanted to have an enormous return. Uh, I think that's why the, the governments have now realized this and they are stepping in. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic in that respect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I would say closing bell. There are no more questions coming in. And uh, there are, of course, a lot of thank yous. That's the first thing. So first of all, we would like to thank you again everybody i see them applauding and um so kevin thank you very much for uh, your talk for uh, answering the questions for giving also your opinion that's i think also important uh, because we are not just only scientists we are also people who are asked and we have to give also answers and also sometimes with a little bit of political touch and uh, but also with the touch of an environmentalist so we have to see all all points and and then i think you did it very very well and so thank you very much on behalf of everybody